excited to bring in a special guest for the very first Market Down Live, a guy who's played on tour for, boy, 23 years, I believe, major champion. So what do you think? Welcome to Market Down Live. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be your inaugural guest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. And, and looking at you, I feel like uh, you have it better than me right now. I mean, I've got this thick uh, hair that I have not been able to go to a hairdresser or a barber to get it trimmed <laughs> up. Whereas you, looks like you do it yourself. You've been doing it for a while, shaving that head. Yeah, um, it started in um, 2008. And okay. the, the only reason I remember specifically when it started is because of, it's actually a pretty funny story. I was in Charlotte and I, I live in Atlanta, so that's about a four hour drive. And um, I played in Charlotte in uh, 2008. And on Sunday, I played, played the tournament pretty well and I was paired with Bill Mickelson. And we both played really well in the tournament that day and finished high and uh, neither of us won, but we were both like fourth, fifth place, you know, like in contention. And um, so I drove home and I got home about uh, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. And my wife had paused the telecast right on the finishing hole. And that's unusual for her. And I <laughs> walked in and she said, I want to show you something. So we both turned to the TV in the kitchen. In fact, that one right there. And so um, I was thinking she's going to say like, like, look at this putt or I want to show you this bunker shot or, you know, something they showed. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> she <laughs> what did she, she show had paused it right on the, the moment of the handshake when you take your hat off. Okay. And at that point, it I still, your head. Okay. Yeah. You know, I took my hat off and went to Phil and it was like, the, you know, of course now social distancing, we're not shaking hands, but this is in a time when we still actually shook each other hands. And so um, I was still hanging on to whatever hair I had. And um, my wife used to call what I had at that time, the monk band, because I was, I had black, dark hair. I mean, dark right here, just like in a <laughs> ring right around my, you know, it was bald up here and it was <laughs> thinning this way. She called it the monk band. Monk and so, um, band. all right. I finish up my knock it in my putt, you know, turn to Phil, take my hat off, and she pauses it. And she goes, Look how bad that looks. <laughs> <laughs> and and she, it was right. I mean, I wish I could pull up a picture of it right now, but my head looked like a carton of Neapolitan ice cream. It was white, black, tan, <laughs> three distinct <laughs> colors. And I know, I mean, since then I've had my own challenges, you know, with my tan line, and it's, you know, they say, you know, notoriety or whatever. Um, the glowing you know, so head. Bad publicity. Snowing, yeah. But that was the moment when she said, look how bad that looks. And I was like, holy cow, that was terrible. <laughs> went straight to the back and lathered up and shaved her right down. And that was the first day. That was 2008. <laughs> Is it a daily thing? No, it's, um, I shave my head now, like, well, since the quarantine started <laughs> once a week. <laughs> yeah. It's, our, About as often as I shave. All our hygiene is out the window right now. Yeah. No, um, it's about uh, about two two or three times a week. And I, when I'm playing in the tournament, it's kind of ritualistic. I always shave my head on um, the either the morning of an afternoon round or the night before an um, early morning round. And mm -hmm. if I if I do um, take a shower the night before an early round, then I'll get up and I'll just rinse off and 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 I won't worry about shaving or anything. And that's uh, that's kind of the ritual. Yeah, we, we, we have lots stuff. Of we have lots of rituals, and that, yeah, we do. Uh, I mean, when you play golf for a long time, where I tell you what, you do develop rituals, and you don't even know most of them are happening until someone like your spouse or your kid says, "Why do you do that every day?" <laughs> <laughs> I like to call them more routines. I feel like that sounds a little bit better. It sounds less crazy. Yeah, less crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, with all that aside, uh, there are certainly you know businesses like a hairdresser, barber, uh, boy, the airlines, hotels. So many people that are thinking about this time with the you know coronavirus and and those businesses that are struggling. Uh, certainly, they're in our prayers and we're thinking about them. But what have you guys been doing there? You're in Duluth, Georgia. You're home. What have you and Lisa been doing now uh, at home, uh, being isolated? Well, yeah, I'm sure our story is the same as everybody else's. For the most part, we've been really just at home. I'm. Um, it, I'm fortunate I live down south where it's starting to get nice and warm and the golf course here in my neighborhood has stayed open and it's actually been super busy. I think people are just like looking for any kind of outlet and the golfers in the community have been out there. I'm proud of the club. It's TPC Sugarloaf and I'm proud of the way they've 
adjusted and adapted to this changing situation, you know, with uh, single carts only and all the employees are, are wearing gloves and wiping things down. And range balls are being um, cleaned with a bleach solution. Wow. All the flags are out of the practice areas. You know, you're not, nobody's touching anything. Mm -hmm. And um, so it gives me a sense of comfort and some pride knowing that it's a TPC, that we're doing the right things. Um, but, you know, we're, I think we're, we started our quarantine here kind of, we self quarantined, I guess you could say. My wife is um, in her, um, she's almost to her fourth year anniversary now since she got diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer back in 2016. And so um, at first I thought, you know, she's not really a susceptible group, but because she's been through chemo and her, her blood counts, you know, are just, they're just always monitoring them. And they're great, but they're still yeah. just, you just don't know. And so, yeah, um, too careful. yeah. And so dur during the onset of the quarantine, my wife was more careful than I thought maybe was necessary. And, you know, I feel like a jerk <laughs> looking back, but <laughs> then, um, so once we kind of started learning more and more like everybody about the virus and everything, we decided that I kind of just organically, we became a little bit more, um, sensitive to the social distancing and the, and she hasn't really been out that much. We've gone to the grocery store. We walked the dogs out in fresh air, but um, she's not been doing very, very much. And just keeping up with some chores around the house. And, um, you know, it's, it's been kind of nice to have some together time with really nothing else on the schedule. I know it's kind of weird. As golfers, I feel like we've never really had an off season. You could maybe say December is an off season on the PGA Tour, but then like, oh, maybe I'll go to Australia and play. But there's always a tournament to play almost every week of the calendar year. Whereas this, I mean, basically the world ranking has just halted. The FedEx Cup standings have just halted here for at least two months. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of our first experience of an off offseason, uh, although we really don't know how long it's going to be. Yeah, and I, the difference between other off seasons, like you said, um, one of my favorite quotes of all time was, um, gosh, I can't remember who it was now, maybe Ben on when he played in the President's Cup in Korea. He said his offseason was a 10-hour flight from Seoul to San Francisco <laughs> to go play in Napa at the <laughs> Safeway. That was his offseason, a 10-hour <laughs> flight. Uh, but yep. um, this feels more like a true offseason because in December, and you know, if you take off three or four weeks after the tournaments and you're getting ready, you're constantly, like, intensely getting ready. Like, you spend the first – Mm -hmm. Maybe you, f you take the first week off and do nothing. And then you take the second week and you're kind of like contemplating like, all right, what adjustments do I need to make? You're meeting with your coaches. You're looking at statistics. You're, you know, ad adjusting your, uh, your workouts and physically you're, you're getting ready to get ready. And then you spend those last two weeks, you know, you're just like intensely ramping up your game until suddenly the bell goes off again, you know, the first or second week of January. So it doesn't really feel much like an off season because you're doing just as much work getting ready as you, doing you know with the exception of the travel they almost and this year it feels like anything. wow this it just came to a halt yeah you're not really uh, yeah it came to a halt really quick and, and you're not really prepping for anything yes you're always trying to get better at golf but uh uh so are you going out and practicing or you're just kind of playing uh at the course uh really neither i mean i've been out four times i think and just to, I've, I've hit some balls and I did some working on, you know, I'm, I'm constantly working on little things in my game to try to get better. And I'm trying to use this as a way to really sort of investigate maybe how I can make some bigger improvements. And, and over this time, we don't know how long it's going to be. Um, right. I haven't played around the golf yet, not since March 13th. Um, but I'm, I'm starting to, and I feel like some of the pros around here, there's, there's a, Atlanta's not exactly like a central point for a lot of players to live, but there's, mm -hmm. if you include the Corn Ferry Tour players and um, a couple of Champions Tour players, and then a lot of like young guys that are just coming out of college, you know, there's a couple dozen guys that live around the area. So I'm going to start a game, sort of like a standing game, like on a Tuesday or something, mm -hmm. where um, everybody's just invited to come and tee it up, you know, and let's throw 50 bucks in the hat or whatever. and just write down a score. I mean, cause I think that's a big part of this is just like not forgetting how to score. I mean, you go to the range and do all your drills you want, but scoring the golf ball is just a, a whole new skill that you can't learn on the practice range. Yeah. And then putting that number next to your name at the end of it is something that we've done since we were kids. And 
uh, it's a good transition to, I got to talk about social media a little bit. Maybe you guys go ahead and throw that on social media because that kind of puts a little extra pressure that you know you're going to post your score. But you were one of, I would say, the pioneers with Twitter. I remember in 2009 when you started, I was one of the guys that was giving you a hard time. Like, why are you doing this, Stuart? I mean, but obviously now everybody's doing it for the most part. It's hard to find a guy on tour that comes out in his 20s that doesn't have a Twitter handle. What got you started and, and and what made you think it was a good idea? Oh, boy. Well, I think motivationally what got me started was um, if, if you look at it from like why in the world would someone – the first person to do social media was just simply telling somebody else what they're doing. Now, that's really what it is. Right. And then the feedback you get from that, if you get positive feedback, it's the same thing as like – taking a bite of ice cream or eating a chocolate chip cookie or, you know, seeing a great movie, the brain reduce, releases chemicals. And it's like, you like that. <laughs> and you want more of it. You know, that's like, yeah. it, at its core. That's what social media really is. It's almost like an addiction. Yeah. The way the body phys physiologically treats it. Mm -hmm. You get that like or that response or that like thumbs up. Great job. Keep it up. You know, you're like, I want more of that. And so, um, and it grows, and now we've seen ex exponential growth. I mean, the, the world is just completely different now. The, mm -hmm. the way that, like, I would say socially it got started for me was it had, had to do with my kids. And Facebook got started before Twitter, and I've never been a part of Facebook. I just never was motivated to do that, Never, and I'm still not on Facebook. Um, I was watching the program on ESPN PTI, you know, with um, – mm -hmm. Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon, and they yeah. were talking about a player in the NBA, and I forget now which one it was, but a player had tweeted that they wanted to trade. And these guys were talking about, oh, the player wants to trade, but the conversation quickly changed over to, what's this tweet thing? And are, are players not going to need the traditional media anymore? Because that's the way that athletes and you know, people that are uh, you know, a well-known personality could use the media in an interview to get their agenda out there. Well, now you can bypass that. And so 2008, we're looking at social media like, is this the new media? Is this the way it's going to be? And so my son, who at the time was about 15, walks into the room and I said, hey, what's Twitter? What is, what is it? And he said, it's, it's kind of like a bare bones Facebook. And what you do is you'll say what you're doing in like 140 characters, I think it was, or at the time, I don't know, 40, <laughs> can't remember now. Yeah. Um, You'll say what you're doing, and then people that follow you will they'll, they'll sign on to get your messages, and they'll just want to learn about your life. And you can show them pictures, or you can just tell them, like, my kids' names are Connor and Reagan or whatever. And yeah. he said, you'll probably end up with probably, like, 500 people following you because you're a golfer and, you know, you're well-known. 500. 500 people. And I'm like, that's 500 fans I didn't know I had before. I'm right. in. So I oh, signed man. up for an account, and, my, and I wrote my first tweet, and I said, taking the kids to hockey practice. That was my first tweet ever. Okay. Like, okay, well, is this how you do it? You know? <laughs> and so, and it turns out that the Twitter world was kind of like waiting for people that they knew to jump on there. And especially as it turned out, the way that I used it at first was, I kind of sensed that there was a lot of people using it like a megaphone that were like mm. just announcing things about them. You know, like, yeah. I have a new deal with this company, you know. And that was like a megaphone, but I didn't like the megaphone thing. I liked the interaction. Like I, I had a lot of followers at first and Connor was wrong. My son, it was more than 500, <laughs> but I, you're about a million everyone. now, aren't you? I was, yeah, I, I was over a million. And now um, I'm a little under that cause I slowed down quite a bit. Yeah. You know, and I just, uh, I slowed down, but I'm a little under a million. Um, but I had an, a one-on-one -on -one sort of, uh, relationship with each one of my followers at first because they would send a comment and I would comment on their comment and it was yeah. like this big all these conversations going in all these different ways and like I said the brain rules were using those chemicals and I was like this is awesome you know Connor said I'd have 500 fans and it was quickly like 5,000 15,000 100,000 wow and um most of the people were like they literally were people that I, I had no idea would have been into golf and a lot of them were golf people but yeah. The thing about our sport is, you know, if you're, if you're not Ricky Fowler, Tiger Woods, obviously, some of the, like, really high personality people that get a lot of attention in the game, then it's really hard for the public to get an idea of who you really are. 
You know, they don't know Mark Wilson or Stuart Sink like they know Ricky Fowler. And back in those days, Camillo was the guy who was like, everybody loved Camillo and his personality was just like coming straight through the camera. Lens. But ours didn't. But you could right. learn things about us, like how many kids we had and where we lived and how far we hit our eight iron and all that stuff. <laughs> right. But that stuff gets boring really fast. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like for me to get this number of fans up and, um, you know, have a new base of fans that I didn't know about, I had to really sort of water that garden and yeah. um, just be myself. And by being myself, I bypassed the need for the coverage of golf to show who I was and I could do it myself and I could control the story. And um, I found it really easy and, and fun and I got a lot out of it myself. And I like, I learned a lot about my followers and I still today have a lot of followers on there that are from the early days that I feel like I know them, even though I'll never meet them. Right. Yeah. And it's not like you were very engaging. I mean, that's one thing there. That, uh, I love it too, when people are replying to my tweets and I, and therefore I want to reply to theirs and, and kind of make a big conversation uh, about the whole thing. And then we it really, it does, it, it gives us a window into uh, the player's personality and not just, you know, your, your rounds of golf and, and really get to know the people. And that's so powerful. You see guys now, I mean, Phil Mickelson came to the game really late, but I think he's loving it, embracing it. Really funny, a great sense of humor. We've seen a new side of him. Max Holm is another guy, a young player that's uh, really taken to it. Yeah. And uh, you know, so I, I think we've learned a lot from you, but any, any other little tips maybe for uh, my viewers here, myself included about how to uh, kind of <laughs> grow our brands using Twitter. Well, I mean, Twitter now we've seen sort of like the the beginning of the sunset, I feel like. You know, I'm, again, I, I learned most yeah. of my stuff from my kids, but it feels like to me that Instagram has kind of been the king right now, and it'll sunset too at some point. But yeah. um, I, I, I got on Instagram, and I'm on there, and I tried to sort of join the, the tide, but I got in at a point where I think I was a little too late, and nobody's really – the sharks aren't circling waiting for golfers <laughs> and people like, like me to join. So right. my followers on, on Instagram are really low and I, I can't, I'm having trouble converting over the, the hey. Twitter followers. So I'm still like, I, I still kind of gravitate towards Twitter cause I know it. And the, I, the biggest thing to me is I, I, I remember um, early on when I was trying to figure it out too, I remember Shaq put out a thing cause he was an early Twitter guy. He put out a little pie chart and it was like okay. um, this half over here is all like, information about you and your what you do basketball golf and then there's the rest of the pie chart was split up between things like pictures of food you like other sports you like um you know just different parts of your life that you are interested in and yeah i i try to stay back from politics and um you know just Things, I mean, yeah, I'm interested in politics because I think you almost have to be at least somewhat interested in politics. You have to know where you stand, but I don't feel like that's really my platform to, you know, get up there and, and rant about because I don't know it. So yeah. the stay, I'm, I'm part of the stay in your lane crowd. I kind of stay in my lane, but I feel like I have a lot of lanes and I don't think you have to be an expert to talk about, you know, how you cook ribs or, you know, mm -hmm. whether you like your truck or not. You, you don't have to be an expert. And so I think just being authentic and being yourself and, um, you know, there's some, there's some people that use it like a, like a text message, like, um, Hey, does anyone know the score of the Collins Hill versus Marietta score game today? You know, that's not really, yeah, that's not really, I think uh, you could look that up. No. Yeah. I think you might be able to, yeah, you might be able to, uh, but it's engaging. Yeah. And I thought, uh, you know, 2009 was a good time. You ended up winning the open championship just a few months after you started with Twitter. And I still remember that photo you put out. I think it was a breakfast thing. And you're like, Hmm, which, which one should I use? And you had some drinking glasses and the claret jug side by side. Which one should I put my orange juice in? Very clever. Yeah, that, that was, um, I don't know, just stuff like that popped into my head. I mean, I had a, um, at that time I had a really good, you know, audience with and the claret jug in my house for a year that was that was yes. utilize you know, that you take wow. advantage of times like that <laughs> yes. yeah so um i remember those things too and it was fun you know to kind of have an idea and uh, lisa would walk into the room and i'd be snickering and she'd be like oh no what is it now <laughs> and i'd have know? some like the orange juice and the glasses and this claret jug set up you know she'd be like oh my God. it's a monster <laughs> And you, you, you kind of talk about expanding your circles. I heard about Max Homa roasting golf swings from a friend of mine who only watches golf because I play golf. 
and he told me about Max Homa. I'm like, how did he figure this out? It's like, because he went kind of above and beyond. And yes, he used golf as a platform, but he was being really funny. And we saw his sense of humor through all yeah. of that. And again, see, you would never know that watching Max Helm play golf on the telecast on Saturdays or Sundays mm -hmm. because golf, just, it, it, isn't, it just doesn't show your personality when you're competing. And plus, most of us figured out a long time ago that the best way to be a successful golfer is to be kind of even keel and be, you know, don't let yourself get too far high or low. And that's, that just translates as boring. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it really does. I'm, and, and I'm not making a joke. It just does. It comes off as boring, like we're all robots. And that's one of the biggest knocks on PGA Tour players. But it's an effective way to be a good golfer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you take Tiger Woods out of the equation with the fist pumps and all that stuff. He thrives on that. But most of us thrive more on being very level, which translates as boring. Yeah, no, it, it, it sure does. And uh, I want to transition um, to two last topics. You've been great with your time here, Stuart. Uh, on Market Down Live, I'm going to get to everybody two things. And the first one is... We're gonna talk about golf swing. I personally have uh, a swing thought that was above and beyond the best I had, where a little part of my career where I played the best. And then of course, when I'm struggling, I always go back to that, hoping it's gonna be uh, the key to get me back to where I was, and it really hasn't been. Do you have a one particular swing thought that was kind of that thing? For, for my own golf? For your own golf, I, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, for, for me, um, I remember back in around, must have been about 2004, I was working with Butch Harmon at the time, and I'm, I'm not anymore, but I was at the time, and uh, we kind of stumbled across a little thing that my lower body was doing on my bad shots, and on my good shots, it wasn't. And so I was focused on that, and it was basically just something as simple as like straightening my left leg a little bit earlier. And when you straighten the left leg in the downswing, you know, you, the only way to do that when your rotation is happening is, your left leg straightens, but your hips also rotate. And yeah. your hips actually, you know, outpace the rotation of your upper body a little bit. And that's what they call the sequence, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I saw that my bad shots, that my left leg wasn't quite getting all the way there. And I was sort of sagging to my left side towards the target a little bit with mm -hmm. my lower body. And so I focused on trying to get that left leg snapped a little bit earlier. And um, it just immediately, like, tightened up my ball flight. And in 2004, so I go out to the first couple of tournaments in 2004 and I have a couple of top tens. And then um, I win at Harbor Town, which is right there behind you. That's right. It's to make you feel uh, comfortable. I, yeah. And, and um, you know, I, I, it was one of those years I had another win later in the year. And I just had like a, a, the year, a good year, you know, you've had great years. I've had great years. The years that you play your best usually are characterized by like, a couple of runs of really good tournaments where you're mm. knocking on the door and you might have a win in there. You might not. But in that year I had a couple of really good runs where I had like fourth, sixth, second, win, ninth, you know, like <laughs> three, three runs of tournaments like that. And I had two wins. And it was mostly because I remember thinking back, the, the year came down to me hitting good drives at key moments, mm. you know, where I've never been a real straight hitter. I've been, um, kind of a little bit erratic with my driving accuracy. And it's always been a thing I try to get better at. And that year, some key drives where I was like tied for the lead on a tough driving hole on the 72nd hole, and I split the fairway. When if I had hit it off the fairway and made bogey, you know, those wins would never ever happen. So that was a big key for me, and it still is. And I'm exactly like you. I still go back to that. I still <laughs> focus on doing that. And it's still a big part of my game that when I'm – it doesn't always just mean that the leg is straight. It just means I'm rotating properly. My sequence is in the right place, but the ball likes it. And it's not like from what I hear you saying too, is that you didn't shift as much towards the target. You were kind of just rotating there, uh, which yeah. is really key. Well, like, uh, you know, I grew up um, in a time and you and I are almost exactly the same age. I think I'm, I'm going to be yep. 47 in May. And um, yep. so we grew up in a time when um, we were kind of like the end of the reverse C, you know, <laughs> era in golf where the lower body would fly towards the target and the upper body would like hang back like this. You know, that was, that was the old reverse C. Yeah. And then when um, Tiger Woods came on the scene and other few guys before him, Nick Faldo, you know, those guys weren't reverse C anymore. They were doing all their rotation in the lower body. 
and the mm-hmm. upper body was kind of staying stacked and they finished over their left foot. And we we're like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> so um, we had to sort of experience that. And I was a reverse sea golfer early on and I had to switch that around. And that mm-hmm. what I'm describing from 2004 is kind of like the opposite of the reverse sea. And that I did all my, I, I felt like I, I squared the club face up with my lower body and I stayed, I, I kept the club face moving towards the target with my upper body. And it was the exact opposite of reverse sea. And it produced really good hitting for me for a long, long time. And, it, and like I said, those key drives, um, the, the, those drives are ones that you never forget. You know, it's like making a putt that counts or hitting a drive that, that you never forget. They're burned into your soul and your memory, and you just want to recreate those. And so um, but that, that was kind of the essence of it for me. Well, that's a great psychology uh, tip for all the viewers, really. Just all those great shots you get, especially in those moments where you're feeling very uncomfortable. Uh, those are the things to lean on when you get back in that same situation. I think of some of your wins, obviously the second, uh, the 18th hole there at Firestone, very demanding tee shot. That yeah. fairway's maybe 25 yards wide, but you really only have about 15 yards to hit it in. You know, mm-hmm. Travelers as well, uh, obviously at Turnberry. Uh, the one behind me here, though, very big fairway. However, uh, still important to be uh, there, you know, within the OB stakes on the right, and the, I've been outside those outside before, before too. <laughs> Do you have any memories? I think when you think of Harvard, when someone says Harbor Town to you, you've won there twice. Uh, you know, where does your mind go? Do you have a particular memory, story, something about Harbor Town? Well, one of the great traditions at Harbor Town is at the conclusion of the tournament, there's usually, if it's good weather, there's a lot of boats out there in the Calabogie Sound. And mm. um, when the winning putt drops, if it's a tap in or if it's a long putt or chip in or whatever, you know, those boats all kind of like, they honk their horn all at the same time. And yeah. that was probably the memory that I have that I hold dearest from that tournament is, um, and I've got two wins there. So I've heard the, I've heard the horn twice. Nice. Is um, that, you know, when you finally knock that ball in and the horn goes off, I'm like, you know what? I'm glad all those boats are making their horn, horn noises, but the loudest horn's going off right inside here where my body is <laughs> finally going, thank you for ending this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, there's something about the relief of a victory. I mean, yes, it's adulation and it's excitement, but there is a bit of a relief. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's because the process of winning on the PGA Tour is just so challenging, and it's getting more and more so every every week. At least it was until everything stopped. (laughs) Yeah, right. But it's just a really – it's a challenging gauntlet to go through, and it's exhilarating, and it's challenging, and it's difficult, but it's also, like, amazingly, you know – fun and it's it's a ride it's quite a ride and the end of it is there's uh, there's a lot of emotions but relief is is a big part of that and that's why i think you see people win and they like there's a lot of this you know and it's, it's yeah. not always you know like the tiger woods or the Payne stewart you know the this clinching yeah. the, the mean face ian poulter he's got the look <laughs> yeah. there's a there, it seems like when people tap in for their wins there's a lot of like ah <sighs> Yeah, and I think we can all identify with that. Yeah, Ian's got to go to the doctor and get his uh, ribs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Stuart, thanks so much for your time, and and yeah, I hope we can get out there sooner rather than later on the PGA Tour, chasing that next victory. Uh, look forward to seeing you out there. I look forward to it too, Mark, and uh, best of luck with the show. And I'm glad to be uh, glad to be your first guest. All right, all right. Uh, being first though means you're gonna have to get on again. Okay. Well, you just tell me when. I think I have time coming up. All right. Thanks, Stuart. Okay. Have a good one.